thank you very very much carol well well done with all those acronyms to welcome everybody um okay i'm going to start off just talking a little bit about um kind of how we know what we know uh and it's specifically to nutrition but it, some of this sort of works with the rest of the world as well so uh often owners get their information from the internet there's there's unfortunately a plethora of various sites which want to give you an opinion about pet foods uh I'm not going to say most of them are wrong, but probably most of them are wrong. Uh, most of them really aren't aren't scientific, scientifically based. So what we look for as as clinical nutritionists is evidence based nutrition, which is founded on objective scientific studies. Okay, Carolyn. As I said, my cat's come to help me. Um, hello, Jack. Anyway, so we're looking for the actual evidence, not just people's opinions on it. Um. It can be difficult because everybody thinks that they know how to feed themselves, they know how to feed their pet because they know how to feed themselves, and we often get these, well, I fed, whatever, and he does fine on it, which your cat might do fine on, on a diet for a long time, but then he gets sick and then this diet doesn't work for him, or he has a problem with his immune system and the diet doesn't work for him, or he may be a susceptible individual or breed, maybe he's a breed susceptible to a heart problem and a particular diet makes that problem show up it makes it reveal itself so these things can work together often they don't show up for years again or only under stress so what we look for when we're looking at research is what's called an evidence pyramid there's several different kinds of these this is sort of a general one i'm not going to go through all the different types of research but we look at big studies or on the top systemic re excuse me i always say that wrong um systematic reviews that have looked at lots of different studies and pulled them together and looked at all their results for that we don't have very many of these in veterinary medicine uh like they do in human medicine because our studies are not as well funded and not as big we kind of come down to the to the bottom of this to where you have editorials or expert opinions that follows me too if i tell you anything that uh, i say isn't based on research and i will try to tell you if something is just my opinion it's just that it's one person's opinion based on my experience below that is anecdote so that you get uh, a smokescreen hiding good data if you have you know preferred by breeders or something this is anecdote it's not really science and no matter how many people say this the plural of anecdote is not data and i really should have a level even below anecdote which is you know one person's opinion um just well i did this and it worked well yeah maybe it worked for you it might not work for everybody else so requirements for the right data, and that is in quotation marks for a reason, is there is no one right data. And these are two, my two current cats, cats right here on the bottom too. It's Jack, this fat cat who just came to visit me for a little bit. So what we look for in the right diet, the basic part of any good diet is that it is complete and balanced these are terms you'll hear over and over again from nutritionists this is the cornerstone of good nutrition um, that means it has all of the nutrients cats require 40 different nutrients in the right amounts and the right ratios to each other so it has to be a diet that's right for a cat um, legally this has to be on the label what animal it's for I have seen a diet fed to a cat once that just said pet food on it the cat had some serious vitamin deficiencies and, and neurological problems because of that diet so that's actually illegal they're not supposed to do that it should be correct for the body condition score of that cat I don't know if you can see in this picture, one of my cats is quite fat, one of my cats is quite thin. So they have very different diets to try to address these two problems. Right, for the life stage, so kitten versus an adult um, or a breeding queen, and we don't really need to do too much too, too special for the males, sorry guys, but breeding for males doesn't take too much of a special requirement as far as nutrition. There's also diets for senior animals. I won't have time to discuss that too much, but that can be that can be important too, although it's not considered 
nutritionally a specific life stage and that's because all seniors are different there's fat seniors and thin seniors and sick seniors and healthy seniors so that's a little bit harder to narrow down um, a, a life stage because they're all different nutritionally different so other considerations as I said here if you want to call obesity healthy there's a question whether or not that should be healthy but anyway seniors and geriatric pets can be different and then we have therapeutic diets for diseases such as kidney disease and liver disease and GI intestinal diseases. So since one of the main criteria I just mentioned was a body condition score, so we need to discuss a little bit about what a body condition score actually is. Um, so it's semi-quantitative, which means we can't put an absolute exact number on it like you could if you measured percentage body fat that's an exact number so this is sort of semi-quantitative and somewhat subjective I will show you how to do this but it's there's a little bit of leeway in there um, so body composition is a continuum which means the numbers could be divided more and more finitely so we put these into big categories so lower numbers are thin higher numbers are fat and this is the body condition score that uh, I like the best there's only five pictures but there's nine different potential scores they go from one to nine one being quite emaciated nine being quite fat 40% body fat you do get kitties fatter than that and we kind of kind of just jokingly call them 11 or a 12 over 9 technically that doesn't exist um, this is from the world small animal veterinary association nutrition uh, the global nutrition committee toolkit um, so please feel free to write down this website or if you just write wasaba.org and then look for nutrition toolkit you will pick this up it is free for you to use and evaluate we've got lots of other um, good information on there about diets and about feeding and about um, taking care of your animals as well so this is a an excellent website for you to have a look at so why do this why do we need a body condition score we can plonk them on the scales and get an idea of what they weigh except that the ideal body weight of cats can vary from about two to seven. So this little kitty over here on the left is a pretty good body condition score and he's probably less than three kilos. The other big Maine Coon belongs to a friend and colleague of mine and he was probably close to seven kilos and was a good body condition as well. So it's kind of hard to get a good idea and it's not an indication of body fat neither of these cats has an excess or too little body fat even though their weights are very different body condition score and percentage body fat have a pretty good correlation which means they relate well to one another not so well with weight so it's a good way to evaluate if your cat is overweight or if your cat is too thin um, and can help you know how your cat should look and how they should feel to you, not how they should feel to themselves, how they should feel when you put your hands on them. We also know that a body condition score correlates with survival time, especially in older cats and in cats with problems like kidney disease, heart failure, and cancer. So as cats get older and they lose weight, they lose body condition, we do know that this is correlated with with how long they're going to live. So if we can improve this body condition score, it might be that we can improve survival time. Now that's a possibility, that's not an absolute proven, no one, it's very hard to get weight onto older cats, but if you can get some weight on them, and we do have some ways in the last few years of doing this with diet and drugs that we didn't used to have. So we have more muscle as well as more fat. They've got uh, sort of a reserve energy source in the fat as well. So it's a good idea to be able to evaluate your cat's body condition score. So I mean, there are movies on the Wasaba website to do this, but I'm going to give you just a few still pictures on kind of the quick and easy how to do this. So there's three main steps. The first is to palpate their ribs. This is my overweight cat, by the way, who's a, about a seven over nine. I like to call him a six, but I know he's actually probably a seven. So he is too fat. So this is me 
palpating his ribs. Uh, he's not delighted with it, but he's letting me do that. So you don't press too hard. And that should feel more or less like the back of your hand, not your knuckles, that's too skinny, and not the palm of your hand, that's too fat. And to be honest, Jack's a little more like my palm than the back of my hand. So a view from the top and you should be able to see a waist in front of their hips. Jack doesn't have a waist. We are working on this by the way. He is on a diet but it's it's a struggle for us. Um, so you can see looking down and this is the view that we have as often as not with our cats isn't it? Looking down on them. So this is a good way to evaluate do they have a nice little dip in here? And as you can see, he doesn't. And from the side, and this is a very hard picture to take of your cat if he runs over to you every time you lie down, by the way. Um, so I finally got him outside. And you can see here, there should be a little tuck up in his tummy. It shouldn't go down and it shouldn't be straight. And Jack's tummy is, well, let's say it's flat anyway. It doesn't tuck up like it should. So he doesn't have a very good waist there. So this is the three steps we look at, and if you look back at the body condition scoring, it tells you exactly where to place your cat based on these three criteria. We also sometimes put in a muscle condition score. I'm not going to go over this too much, <clears throat> but it does add a little bit more information to assessing your cat and what they should be being fed. So sort of do they have enough muscle over their shoulder and over their, over their top line and over their hips? Okay, now we're going to go move on from the kitties for a bit and actually talk about the foods. Again, I said the recommendation is for complete and balanced cat foods. The term complete is a legal definition. If uh, pet food says it's complete, it legally is meant to be complete and contain all the nutrients that um, the cat needs. There are also uh, foods and treats that fall into the category of complementary. Um, these may be just treats or they may be an incomplete food that should not be fed by itself long term. And they can look very similar on the store shelf. Uh, I actually just fell for this. Even though I know better, I fell for some and bought a, a, a complementary food the other day, um, looking at something rather than a complete food. So you also can see it should be labeled, uh, legally has to be labeled, that it's a complimentary food, can be fed as a snack added to the food. Uh, and this one it actually says can be used as a, you might recognize what this is too, uh, can be fed as a treat or a topping or to crush up tablets in it. So this is a, a paste that's highly palatable. So how do you know if it's complete and balanced? Well, if it says on the label, it, it's supposed to be for starters. Um, and what we use in Europe and will continue to do, uh, regardless of our, our status in Europe, um, is what's called the FEDIF nutrient requirements. And these are uh, standard of requirements based on research. They're updated pretty frequently as new research comes out. Um, and it is a trade association backed up by a scientific advisory board. <coughs> so our local UK trade association is the Pet Food Manufacturers Association, the pfma.org.uk. Make sure you put in UK. If you do Google this, so you'll end up with some group in Pennsylvania. Um, they're a great outfit. They have lots of information on their website that's very, very useful. So uh, definitely have a look at, at those two organizations' websites. Lots of information in there. So again, kitties have 40 nutrient requirements. The minimums for all of these, maximums for some of them are set up by FEDIF. Now, in order to meet that and say the food is complete, all they actually have to have is a computer formulation. I, I'll try to just discuss what that means in just a bit here. Whoops, in countries other outside of Europe, the Association of American Feed Control Officials has the same uh, responsibility for setting up nutrient requirements, which are fairly similar to the ones we use in Europe. Not identical, but very, very close. So again, requirements are for adults, for reproduction and growth, not Specific requirements for seniors, as I said earlier, because they're all different, so we can't set up specific requirements for, for all seniors. We know the kinds of things that they need, but we, there's just not specific requirements for them where there are four kittens and four mummies. 
<laughs> okay, just to quickly show you the booklets that come out, these are Ooh, that came out a bit blurry. These are free online from FEDIF, the nutrient requirements. Also, there's some other information in the book. They do a couple other guidelines as well for manufacturers to sort of say how to put things together. So words without European regulation. So things that don't necessarily mean anything. Hypoallergenic means absolutely nothing. This one drives me nuts. Royal Cannon does have a product with this name. It is a trade name for that product. Other than that trade name, if you see a diet that says hypoallergenic, it doesn't mean anything. Because what's hypoallergenic for your cat and what's hypoallergenic for my cat might be different. It depends on what you're allergic to. Um, the term natural, we have guidance for the definition in EU and in the UK, uh, it's not regulated but we do have a guidance for it, which kind of means what you think it means, basically, that there's nothing artificial in that. Organic meanings differ by country. <coughs> Grain-free doesn't mean anything. Free from doesn't really mean anything. We assume that if it said it's free from, that won't have that ingredient in it, but they don't have any regulated meaning. Holistic means absolutely nothing. That's another one that kind of drives me nuts. There's no such thing as a holistic diet. They're just, they're all holistic, really, in a way. Um, <laughs> um, premium and super premium are marketing terms. Sorry about the puppy up there. I couldn't find a kitty picture quickly enough. Um, they don't have a legal meaning either. You assume that this is possibly a higher quality food, although, um, oops, got ahead of me a little bit, although because there's not a definition, you can't know what that means. Human grade, this one is a little bit annoying in the EU as well because what we don't allow in Europe we don't allow any ingredient from an animal that has not passed veterinary inspections as being fit for human consumption at the time of slaughter. So all of our pet foods are human grade, if that meant anything. It does mean something in the U.S. It doesn't mean anything here. All of our foods are from a slaughterhouse that, that is doing human foods. So all these rumors you hear about waste products, about about roadkill, about diseased animals going into the pet foods are incorrect. That is not true. That's a myth. So this one, we have holistic up here at the top, which means absolutely nothing. Grain-free, well, we can assume that there's no grain in it, but other than that, it doesn't mean anything. And one of my favorite bits down here on this is that it's a chicken recipe with life source bits. I have no idea what that would mean at all. It certainly has no regulated or legal meaning. And this one is another real favorite of mine, this wild cat. Your cat doesn't look like this probably, by the way. Is this cat who's eating in the wild is eating a feline formula with trout and smoked salmon, which is an interesting thing to find in the wild. I think most salmon aren't smoked when they're in the river. <laughs> So again, it's all marketing terms, so just be aware of this. I meant to comment on this before where this says all life stages diet on the bottom. If you buy something that says all life stages, that might be just fine, but it's a kitten diet because kittens have higher requirements. Kittens and, and reproducing queens have higher requirements than adult animals do. So if it's for all life stages, it basically is a kitten diet, which might be absolutely fine, especially if you're feeding kittens. Um, it might not be what you want for your 18-year-old cat. You might not want to be feeding him a kitten diet. Maybe you do. Depends on his specific needs. So how do we know that they're okay? The basis is computerized formulation. We always start these by computer to sort of look at what foods go into them and do they meet the nutrients that we need. <coughs> all foods start with this. The big companies have professional formulators that that's all they do and they're amazing people. Next step is a chemical analysis. Third step is a feeding trial. And the basic feeding, trial are, feeding trials are those designed by the American Feed Control Association of Feed Control Officials. Um, we use similar ones in Britain. We just don't have one with our own name on it. So these are the three steps that we look at. The bigger companies often do longer feeding trials. Some of them do lifelong feeding trials to where they take kittens or middle-aged cats and feed them all the way until they uh, die of old age or are humanely euthanized due to a disease. 
So some of these big companies do some amazing, amazing research for that. <laughs> so the co computer analysis, as I said, is a starting point. They may use a standard table. And again, the big companies use these professional, <coughs> excuse me, formulators. Now, if you only are computer balancing or computer formulating and you're not doing chemical tests or feeding trials, you're kind of missing some potential problems. And you can label your diet complete if this is all you've done. It is legal to do that. Um, and some of the smaller companies, that's all they do. They don't have the resources to do feeding trials or long-term feeding trials or even the chemical analyses are, are fairly expensive. So if you're using a standard table, that also is making the assumption that your ingredient is identical to the ingredient in the, in the database and the tables that you're using, which it may not be. Now, the big companies, some of the ones that use these formulators, they actually check their ingredients against what their formulators are doing. So it's a little more accurate. But we do have nutrient interactions. If you put certain minerals with certain fatty acids, things like that, they will interact with each other and can decrease the amount that actually is absorbed. So there are some potential problems here, but they can claim complete. Chemical analysis, yeah, at least gives you a basic idea of what goes to the diets as far as some of the larger nutrients. It doesn't give you, again, the interactions. It doesn't go down to the vitamin levels and some of that. It doesn't measure some of the, the ingredient, excuse me, the nutrients that are in kind of smaller amounts. In trials, um, as I mentioned, that the Association of American Feed Control Officials, those are the basic protocols we have for maintenance, which means an adult animal for growth and for pregnancy and lactation. <clears throat> so they check quite a few things. The shortest length of time, these can be a six months. They check the overall health. They have veterinary checks on them. They check coat quality, weight. They do a bunch of blood tests to make sure that they stay healthy on these as well. So it's still not ideal. The lifelong studies are ideal. We really want to know what happens if you feed this diet for 16 years, not six months, but it's better than nothing. So what has to be on the label? Like I mentioned earlier, you have to say what species it's for. You have to say if it's complete or not. And if it's all life stages, it's a kitten. You have to have the ingredients on there by the, by the wet weight, which means it's going to be different in a wet food. And you have to have the nutrients on there. You have to say, whoops. Uh, what additives are in there, and they will pretty much all have some additives for various things. Um, they'll have added vitamins, they'll have some added um, antioxidants. Like in a human food, you have to have best before dates, you have to have who's, who's making it and where, how to get hold of them. And there should be feeding instructions or guidelines on there as well. This is quite complicated and I, I might be a little bit hard to see depending on the size of your screen. I, I like this rather than the fact that some of it's in French as well as in English, but it's one of the international global companies. But they give, um, they give the feeding amount for a fat cat and for a cat who's at an ideal weight and they go from two kilos to 10 kilos. So they've got lots of the weights covered well here too. Like a human food, the weight of the food has to be on there too. So additives, as I mentioned, can be things like vitamins and minerals um, that they need to add in order for the food to be complete. When I do homemade diets, I always, always, always have to add a vitamin mineral supplement to the diet. So if you just feed chicken or chicken and something else, potato or something, the diet's not going to be complete. It, they just aren't. There's going to be sometimes, say, uh, some of the gelling agents and things like this um, to make the food have the consistency that they do. There's going to be um, antioxidants uh, and such to keep the food fresh for longer. There's some flavors added. There are some colors added. And before we sniff too much about colors added, remember we have colors added to human foods too. <laughs> A little bit more vibrant than cat foods even. And again, this is some of the additives. I know that doesn't read too clearly. Some of the additives where there's some vitamins, there's some iron, there's some calcium added to this diet. So the ingredients, 
are in descending order. So the ingredient at the top has the most by wet weight. So this is going to be a little bit different if it's a dry food or a wet food. And we have a couple of different ways of doing this in the EU and in the UK. There can, it can actually say that it's lamb or it's chicken or salmon or whatever. And this will include the flesh and the meat from that species. Well, it's not going to be lamb skin, but you know, chicken skin can be in there. So there's no feathers other than one diet that's made from feathers, no so feathers, no so hair, no heads, no feet, no hooves. You will hear that these things go into pet foods. They do not, that is incorrect. The other labeling that we have is what's called category labeling. And this is where you will see uh, meat derivatives or veg derivatives of vegetable origin, um, uh, vegetables, uh, cereal derivatives. So derivatives, oops, sorry. Derivatives is a terrible name because it makes it sound like it's some abnormal product, which they aren't. They aren't, you know, chemically derived or anything. So we have a couple of different kinds. One is dehydrated poultry, meats, other things. So these are just that. They're processed with heat, so they kill harmful organisms. They're cooked, but they're not ground. So you can see this if it's high up as the wet weight, there's going to be more meat in this if that's high up. So if that's a second ingredient, there's still going to be a lot of meat in that. Or you can have these as meals, which means they're cooked, again, which kills bad bacteria, um, and ground up so that they're smaller. So a lot of the websites about pet foods get quite excited about the ingredient list and try to imply that they are an indicator of quality. Generally, they are not. So here we have an example. You've got dried turkey. Remember, there's probably quite a bit of turkey in there because it's dried. So if we put the water back in that turkey, it'd be even more. We've got rice and rice bran and flour and some oats. So would meat come first of all the rice for one? Well, maybe it would, maybe it wouldn't. You can't actually tell. Uh, and if the meat were wet, it would be even higher. So you can't tell. And it probably doesn't matter. Cats, like all animals, need nutrients, not ingredients. The ingredients are just a way of getting to the nutrients. So we do have some terms with specific meanings for how much of an ingredient is included. One is called flavored with. These are pretty small. It's less than 4% of that ingredient. So if it says flavored with chicken or flavored with tuna, there's probably a lot of other things in there. Is that a problem? So you can see this one, it's with tuna, but it has meat and animal derivatives, probably chicken or something like that as the first ingredient. Oh, I wanted to go back to flavored with. I meant to, I said, meant to say something else. The flavored with uh, legally means, well, it's less than 4%. It's probably more than 1%. But it means that the animal can tell that that flavor is there. I have no idea how they know if the animal can tell. I, you'd have to ask it. Well, this is getting ahead of me. It's advancing on its own. Sorry. So we have rich in X, which is at least 14%, um, or X dinner, so beef dinner or something that like that, is at least 26%. So these kind of go up. If it says that it's beef, then it has to be all beef. So again, does it matter? Probably not. I feed my cats with some products like this that are flavored with one thing but have other things in them. My cats don't have allergies, so I don't worry about it. Okay, there have been implications by some companies that certain products are bad. Wheat is bad, or soy is bad, or dairy is bad, or corn is bad. Uh, not necessarily. Corn Corn is actually a pretty good ingredient. It contains some essential fatty acids that they need for their coat and their immune system. It contains some B vitamins. It has protein in it. Um, the protein quality might not be as high as other things, but the company will add other things to it to make up all the amino acids to make the protein quality that the cat needs. So if you're not allergic to corn, if you're not allergic to soy, if you're not allergic to wheat, and very few cats are, by the way, um, these are fine, and cats can digest them. So things that are not in pet foods. There's no roadkill. There's no dead animals. There's no dead pets. There's none of this. Uh, it's, it's, it's an insane idea that people come up with because not only would it be unethical and illegal, it's unsustainable. Where are you, gonna, where are you going to source hundreds of thousands of those? 
fillers. There are this there's idea on a lot of the websites that there's fillers in pet food. It, I'm not even entirely sure what's meant by that. I think it means carbohydrates or fiber, which are nutrients. Cats don't specifically require them. They can digest and utilize them. They can use the energy. They can use those B vitamins that are in corn. They can use the protein that's in there. Byproducts. Byproducts are the same as that meat and poultry derivatives term that we use more often in, in the EU. So, yep. There are unused products from the human food industry. Again, it's from the human food industry slaughtered under the same conditions as food for humans uh, under veterinary supervision. It's the parts of the animals that we may not choose to eat or may choose to eat depending on your culture, the heart, the lungs, some of the muscle meats are sometimes included. Um, there are sustainable use of these products or meats, you know, hearts, Kidneys are perfectly good, good meats. Um, and if you are against using these, if you want your cat to have a steak or a big hunk of tuna or whatever, you need to ask what's happening to the rest of that carcass. Uh, if we're not putting it into pet foods, some of it will go into a fertilizer. The rest of it goes to landfills or is incinerated. Both of these things will, especially incineration, the landfill can potem potentially contaminate the water source. If they're incinerated, they, con they contribute to global warming. So this is actually a very green use of the whole carcass so that if you're going to slaughter an animal, I think we owe it to the animal to use as much of it as we can. The other thing I wanna comment on is some of these products that potentially could go into uh, a pet food some, I live in Scotland, some cultures eat some of these things. So basically tripe and blood mail. So it is often more of a cultural problem than, than anything, or not problem, but a cultural decision not to eat these rather than anything else. But if we aren't eating them, they need to go somewhere if we're slaughtering the animals. That's my little soapbox, sorry. <laughs> okay, so what else is on it? Um, I mentioned the nutrient analysis, which will include the protein, the oil or fat, the fiber, and this is um, not all of the fiber that goes into it. It's mostly the type of fiber in it that, uh, that doesn't absorb water. If you think of lettuce or the strings and celery, things like that, that kind of fiber, which actually can be very beneficial for the large intestine, so it's a good thing to have some fiber in there. Ash, which always sounds horrible. It sounds like you're putting you know, something from your fireplace in, but ash just means minerals, calcium, phosphorus, potassium, zinc, things like that that are required um, are come into the ash. The moisture, if it's over 14%, so wet foods will have the moisture listed. Um, the dry foods have a little bit of moisture in them as well. Cat foods, probably five to 8% uh, water in a, in a dry food. They're not completely dry. So again, the nutrient analysis. So I've sort of hopefully maybe or not convinced you that the ingredient list doesn't indicate quality. What about the nutrient analysis? It doesn't give us enough information. So protein's actually made up of amino acids. And what we need to know is how many of those amino acids are in there. Kitties not only need their 10 to 11 essential ones that must be in there. Cats also need non-essential ones, which sounds kind of counterintuitive because if they're non-essential, why would you need them? It's kind of a cat thing almost more than, than, than other species is they need lots of extra protein. They're a protein driven species. So they need all of their regular amino acids plus some extra ones. And this is some of what we talk about protein quality. Fats, yeah, we know how much fat is in the diet, but we need to know a little bit more which fats are in there. We have some essential fats, some essential fatty acids um, that a good company has to put in and will put in. So the good companies have to put all these in in order to call it complete. But the ingredient, or excuse me, the nutrient analysis doesn't tell us that. So again, carbohydrates, there's lots of different types. There's lots of different types of fiber sources. It's, and that's not on the label anyway. The vitamins, not really on the label. We know that they're added. If it says complete, then they have to be in there, but we don't really know how much or which ones are in there. And the same with the minerals. So another thing that we can't tell from a label is the digestibility. And this is the amount of the ingredient 
that the cat can use. So basically it's food in minus poop out. So this can be for overall the whole digestibility of everything. So how much food goes in, how much poop goes out, or it can be for say protein or calcium or a specific nutrient. So this is, sorry again, it's a puppy here, but this is kind of, we have the food, we measure the food, we feed that, we'll pretend that's a cat. Um, and then we measure what goes out and we come down to down here, the digestibility can't be determined by reading the label. There's no way of knowing that. Again, the bigger companies will actually be doing this test and they do, the not, do know the digestibility of the foods. So comparing pet foods, what you're reading on the label is what we call as fed. So that's with the water included. So if it says 1% protein, which nothing ever would because that's not enough protein, but this is just my example so you can follow it, would be a gram of protein and 100 grams of food. Now, it's probably going to be more like 30 in a cat food in there somewhere. So if we mathematically, or even really by drawing it, took all the water out, then we would look at, say, a nutrient based on the total dry part of the food. So if you did it on a moisture-free basis. So a canned food, 75, 80% water, about five to 10% in a dry food. So if you took, that's why when you read the protein on a dry food, it might say 28%. If you get your wet cat food, it might say it's 10% protein. That's because it's also including the water. So. I know that's a little bit confusing and students have trouble with the math on this too, but it will look lower on a wet food because we're doing up there. You can also measure it on like how much calcium there is per 100, um, 100 calories of food too. It makes it hard for, to compare the diets unless you know the math on how to compare it all on dry matter, which I don't have time to teach you tonight. Okay, other things that can make it expensive, expensive ingredients. Yeah, if you do have a specific ingredients in there, so it's an all lamb diet or something, that's going to make it more expensive, especially if it's a fixed formula so that exactly that lamb goes in there every time. If it says meat and meat derivatives, maybe they can use mutton this week and lamb next week and make it a little cheaper. If it's a fixed formula, they have to stay with exactly um, that ingredient, just like if you're baking a cake and you don't make any substitutes, that's a fixed formula. If they can have a little bit more leeway and exactly what goes into it, which is what the category labeling of using meat derivatives allows a company to do, say, you know, it's maybe partly beef and partly pork, and they can change those ratios a little bit depending on the market then that diet can be less expensive. It doesn't matter if your animal is allergic to an ingredient, it matters if your animal is not allergic to an ingredient, it probably doesn't matter. We don't, most of us, we don't eat the same thing for dinner every night. And most of us do just fine not having the same thing for dinner every night. Feeding trials are expensive. I think they're essential, but they are expensive. So companies who do that, their foods may cost a little bit. The amount of quality control of their ingredients and their processing can make it more expensive. Some of these big companies, there is a quality check at every step from before a truck of ingredients gets onto the grounds, is allowed onto the grounds, all the way to the final product. So if they're adding extra antioxidants, if they're adding prebiotics, which are fiber sources that feed good bacteria, if they're adding omega-3 fatty, acid, omega fatty acids like fish oil, things like that will add to the cost as well. How much research they do can be expensive. And of course, their marketing as well. And some foods are, it's all about the marketing for sure. And this is just grain-free foods. I think we'd see a dip. This only went out to the 2018. I think we'd see a dip in this in dog foods now because some of them uh, are less popular than they were a few years ago because of some of the problems that they have been associated with. So some of the things that are added to some foods for various things, chondroitin sulfate and glucosamine for joints, grain lip muscle for joints, medium chain triglycerides, not so much for kitties, that's kind of a dog thing, so I'm going to just breeze by that one. L-carnitine helps in weight loss diets, helps keeps the cats healthy. Prebiotics, again, um, some pretty good evidence for kitties that some of the fiber sources that feed good bacteria are useful, apparently it looks like that. Oh, that's chicory, looks like that. Omega-3 fatty acid, as I mentioned, and antioxidants and others. So calorie content will not be on the label 
in Europe. Uh, we may get it someday. They're getting it in the U.S. and right now we're doing a watch and see to see how well it works there. If we should do it here, I think we should. Um, <clears throat> Because especially if you have a fat or thin animal and you want to know how many calories you're getting into them, it'd be really useful. The companies can often, big companies in particular, can give you this information. Not all weight loss diets are the same. Not all weight gain diets are the same. You know, I've got my fat cat on a weight loss diet, my thin cat on the highest calorie uh, senior diet I could find. You can get this information from some of them, phone them, or it might even be on their websites occasionally. Other thing you can do, the Pet Food Manufacturing Association, I mentioned their website, the pfma.org.uk. You can use a calculator on their website to estimate the calories in the food. It's not going to be 100% accurate, but it's not too bad. You just get hold of the label and all the information I told you about on the label, the protein and fat that's on there, and plug that into their little formula, and it will give you an estimation. So if you wanted to compare a couple of different foods for whatever reason, maybe a fat cat, um, this could be a very useful thing to do. Although, I will say for weight loss, I would recommend that you use a therapeutic weight loss diet. So I would be comparing those. If you feed less of a regular food, you can get into some deficiencies of other nutrients. It isn't just less calories. Okay, we also get questions about homemade pet foods. I'm not going to go into this too much because I can talk all night about this. Some people just want to feed this. Fortunately, I think it's a little bit more of a thing for dogs than cats, but some people want to feed it for whatever reasons. Please don't feed vegetarian or vegan diets to cats, but you might want to know what's going into your cat's food, or you have concerns about commercial diets, or you just like cooking for your animal. Or probably the biggest reason is that your pet needs to be on a therapeutic diet, and neither he or she won't eat it, or it just doesn't work for some other reason. And then once in a while, we do need to do homemade diets problems with them. They are, if you don't have them well formulated and all of the ones, I mean literally all of them in one research uh, project that looked under 104 different recipes from the web and from books, they were all either deficient, mostly deficient, some had some excesses, but they were pretty much deficient. So some of them are too high in some other ingredients. Um, they are incomplete and unbalanced. They're not basically not good diets unless you actually have them specifically specifically formulated. The ones in books, if it just says out of vitamin mineral supplement, that means nothing. The one you're adding might not be right for that diet and it might be different. <clears throat> Raw diets, there's two different forms of this, homemade and commercial ones. The homemade ones have all the same problems that all the other homemade diets have. They're incomplete, they have deficiencies, they have excesses. Um, that's a dog, sorry, but it's a puppy that uh, was being fed a homemade diet. His legs should not look like that. Um, he had some terrible growth problems. <clears throat> even in the commercial diets, even in a commercial frozen diet, freezing does not kill bacteria. <clears throat> it decreases Campylobacter. It doesn't kill Salmonella, Salmonella or Listeria. There's been a very high incidence of bacteria in those diets. There's a risk of toxoplasmosis, and just this past year in the UK, there was a frozen homemade diet that killed over 50 cats. I think we're up to around 90 cats killed over 50 cats due to, to tuberculosis. There's also a risk of ingesting bones. They don't, they don't increase the health of teeth. They increase the appearance of the teeth, but not the health. Um, they decrease tartar, but they don't decrease periodontitis or, or tooth loss. And you do risk um, having them injure the gut, get stuck in the esophagus and break the teeth. <clears throat> oh, I forgot I put Pippin in here. Pippin was a cat on a homemade raw diet. This is what Pippin looked like on his homemade raw diet. Uh, this is what Pippin looked like when he was put on a good balanced diet. So we'll go back to Pippin's poor little nose here. His immune system wasn't very good. He, he can't see quite here, but he should have a big fluffy tail. He had uh, lesions around his eyes. You can see this isn't completely healed on his eye. His tail's nice and fluffy now. And he has a little smile because his face is better. <clears throat> so just roughly comparing these two homemade diets, increased incidence, especially if they're raw of bacterial infection, risks of bones, 
where I talked about good feeding trials being done um, on some of the pet foods. If you are feeding a homemade diet, you're doing a feeding trial on your own animal. Your own animal is the guinea pig for that diet rather than having a controlled feeding trial um, on lots of animals. Um, Grain-free diets, I'm going to talk not too much about this. There's an idea there's more natural. As I've mentioned a few times, cats can can digest grains. The, the, you always see on these websites that they can't. Yes, they can. Um, there's about a 90% digestion rate, which is pretty good. That's as good as anything else with, with grains and that. Also, grain-free doesn't necessarily mean carbohydrate-free. And if it is a low-carb diet, it's going to be high in fat or protein. Probably high protein in a healthy cat is okay. So I'm not saying you shouldn't feed grain-free. It's probably okay because um, cats can usually handle um, lots of protein. I would be careful with a, if you have a, a queen who's having kittens, it's easier to make milk sugar from carbohydrates than it is to make it from fat and protein. And if you have a really active cat who's very crazy, plays a lot, it's kind of easier to keep the liver um, energy stores up. So where I mentioned grain-free may not mean carbohydrate-free, as far as calories, we have three parts of the pie. We have carbohydrates, protein, and fat. If you lower one of those, one or both of the other two have to go up. So low-fat diet's probably going to be high in fat and carbs. A low-carb diet's going to be high in fat and protein. So is that a problem? It may not be, or it may be, depends on your cat. Some of them do great on it. So some of the, I've mentioned some of these as I went along, some of the sources of good information, FEDIF has good information on there. You can look up all those nutrients if you want. It's a little bit mind boggling, the amount of information they have on it, the different ways they present it. But there's other good information on that website as well. The PFMA has some very owner friendly stuff on it too, just Oh, God, all sorts of ideas. They have lots and lots of, of just sort of bits of information you can find away, and it's a pretty friendly website. The wasava.org nutrition toolkit has those body condition um, charts in it. They all, there's also, oh, well, I wish it wouldn't do that on its own. There's also a little movie on how to do those uh, assessments on kitties. There's some information about choosing pet foods right now. I'm going to squirm a little because we need to get it a little bit more uh, Europe oriented. There's also a, um, uh, some information about labeling on there, which does have both the Europe and, and uh, the US on it. There's also a fun blog here. It is a little bit US based, but it's just good information from the pet nutrition at Tufts. This is a Tufts University in Massachusetts, and there's several board, nutri board certified veterinary nutritionists who put that blog together and have great information on it too. So what's the the best diet for your cat, a complete and balanced diet. It's right for your cat's life stage. Um, <clears throat> people ask, often ask me if I believe in senior diets. Uh, there's some good research behind them. Pick the one that's right for your cat. My old cat's on a very high calorie one because he's skinny. So just consider things like that. So body condition, activity level. Do you want some functional ingredients in there? If you have joint problems, looking for omega-3 fatty acids can be useful or glucosamine or um, greenlit muscle. A reputable company that does good quality control, does feeding trials and does research. And I just wanted to stick this in here because this idea of them doing research, we always have this, um, this idea that they, you know, have these cats trapped in little tiny cages or something. This is actually one of, this is a research facility. This is how their kitties live. Um, they're group housed. They each have a dedicated cat petter player. I really think that's what I want to do when I retire is go be the cat petter player for them. Um, so these cats live in an environment as close to a home environment as they can. These cats uh, that are together, they make sure that they are compatible together. They don't have cats in, in cat fights there, like you might think with that many. They also have places they, that they can go to be alone. To the cats can can have their their private time too. So these these good companies have just amazingly kind of well high welfare standards for their cats. And there is 
my skinny old man before. He was quite as skinny as he is now. So it looks like I have managed to talk just about fast enough that we do have some time for questions. Yes, thank you very much, Marge. That was really, really interesting. So there's nothing, I've got no questions come through on my panel here. So Marge, okay. I don't know if on the bottom of your screen where it's, if you bring up the black bar, it might say Q and A. It does. Bottom. So I don't know if you, if you click on that, I don't know if any questions have maybe come through to you and not I to have me. No, no open questions, although I have somebody, somebody said it raised their hand. I have no open questions, no. So if anyone has any questions. Oh. Oh, where we go. <laughs> Somebody, can you see this too? I've got two that have just come through. Yeah, number of hours between meals. Yeah, how, so how, mm. yeah, how often would you recommend well, let's that? Let's see, what do we say this? Um, I'm, that's hard because it depends, you know, if you're working all day, it can be very hard to feed your cat as frequently as your cat wants to be fed. Obviously cats, cats, if they, cats, when they have their own way, will eat about 10 times a day. So I'm not recommending you come home from work, feed your cat 10 times a day. If it's a skinny cat that doesn't live with a fat cat, you can free choice feed them, which means leave a bowl of dry food out and let them snack. Um, I think twice a day would be a minimum. I wouldn't want to see cats fed only only once a day. So twice a day um, would probably be my minimum. If you do say you have a thin cat, you need to get more food in him, or maybe you have a diabetic cat that you need more frequent meals for, um, uh, get an automatic feeder if you can't be home. Ratio of complete to complementary. Okay, what we usually say, now this means you have to figure out the calories in your cat's diet. So go on to the pfma.org.uk and you can figure out the calories in both the complementary and the complete. The rule of thumb we use is 10% of a non-complete diet. So 10% treat snacks, complementary food. So 25 is actually a little bit too high. Um, the question was, can we go with 25% with of, a, of a complimentary food? That's higher than most of us would recommend. Um, see if you can get a little bit more of, of your cat's regular complete diet into them if you can. Uh, Carantine and cassia gum are not specifically, oh, they do have to be on the labels. I'm sorry. No, they probably will be on them. Hey, I'm just, oh, there's one here. Can um, I say which room that feeding, which company that, that yes. room for feeding research on? Can I, can I say that? Can I, I think, can, I think can so. Can I say who that was? It was Waltham. Yeah. It, it's, it's, yeah, it's the Waltham company in Nottingham, or they're near Nottingham anyway, um, that does, uh, they are some of the research behind Royal Cannon, although Royal Cannon also has a, a similar facility in France. Um, they do things like whiskers, uh, I think, Sheba might be one of their products too. Anyway, yeah, it's rock. It's uh, Waltham. And there's one question come through from Nicole. How can you manage a hungry cat who's on steroids, who's starving, oh. um, but overweight, <laughs> and he's probably a six or seven body condition score already? Gosh, yes, I, I feel you. <laughs> yeah. Um yeah, kitties fortunately aren't quite as bad as dogs when they're on steroids, but I do know that that drive for hunger. Um if he is an older cat, now I could get in trouble with some people for saying this. If he's over 12, shall we say, and he's a six and not really a seven, I mean, my, pretend my cat's a six, but he actually is a seven. I would just maybe feed him a lower calorie diet. Um, you could even feed a weight loss diet and, and you know, if he started to lose too much weight, just feed him more of it. The weight loss diets are complete and balanced diets. So the commercial weight loss diets are not a bad choice for a cat like that because then he could eat a little bit more but not get too mm -hmm. obese, hopefully. Yeah. It's, it's hard. Um, I can tell you what I do with my fat cat is I have an interactive feeder for him because I work from home a lot of the times, is I feed him quite frequently. Now, I have to make sure that he doesn't get skinny cat's food, which he does love, um, but I just do very, very frequent feedings of very small amounts, and that keeps him from begging too much. So, hard problem, I feel. Uh, yeah, <laughs> difficult, difficult there. Difficult, yeah. Um, and I have another one saying, would you recommend a dry food or a wet food for cats? Um, good question. I actually recommend that they have both. Now, this is my kind of my personal opinion. Well, there is some science behind it too, but it is also my personal opinion. Especially for young cats, I'd like to see a cat, um, say over 
like below one year of age eat both types of food and actually it's probably good to keep them on both types of food several reasons not entirely scientific but kind of scientific one especially if you're feeding free choice dry it can be hard to know how much they're eating especially if you have more than one cat so if you're feeding some canned cat food you know if the cat's eating you because if they're not eating then there could be a health problem and you need to know that immediately you have a better idea of how much they're eating as well um, and there are some health problems that the therapy requires a canned food and even some health problems that the therapy requires a dry food cats can get very attached to eating one type of food or the other so it's good if they are familiar with both in case they get I don't know, kidney disease or something, and you need them on a, or you want them on a canned food. Um, dry food does not cause kidney disease, by the way. You will see this occasionally in the lay press. There's pretty good evidence that that's not true. It doesn't cause it. However, after they have it, then I prefer to see them on a canned food just to increase the moisture intake. So my answer is both. And that is what I do with my cats, although my skinny cat doesn't really like canned food very much. And once in a while he does. He likes the other cat's canned food, of course. <laughs> of course, of course. That tends, of course. To, tends um, to be how they are. <laughs> for fat, I mean, just very quickly, for fat cats, probably canned food is a good option because there's lots of moisture in it. For skinny cats, more calories per gram of food as fed um, um, in a dry food. Okay. Um, I have another question about uh, tinned tuna in spring water. Uh, this mm -hmm. uh, this lady's cat has IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, mm -hmm. and will often totally stop eating. And oh. the only way they can restart her eating is yeah. to get to give some tuna, but they worry about the high salt content in the tuna. Is there anything you'd like to say about that? Uh, if you're doing it in spring water, the salt's not too bad. If you're doing it in brine, the salt's pretty high. <laughs> yeah, spring water, you're, you're fine. The, the tuna in spring water, it's not a balanced diet. If it just takes takes that to kind of get him jump started and eating again. Um, yeah, you do what you have to do. If that's all he will eat, um, probably have your vet get hold of me and we can talk about maybe balancing that a little bit better. But yeah, I understand what we go through to get our cats to eat. Um, there is a very good drug you could try as well if your cat is not on mirtazapine. Talk to your vet about that. It's, it's a really good drug for, for cats who aren't eating well. Uh, yes. kidney cats old cats whatever and then we have one from Suzanne who has an 18 year old kitty cat called Boris and he's on uh, seven and a half milligrams of flamazole for his hypothyroid mm -hmm. and he's very fussy eater but he does like licking the gravy on some of the gourmet <laughs> pearl foods and his dry foods and also their next door neighbor's cat food of course he always mm -hmm. has food available but always wakes up wakes the, the owner up hung hungry during the night um, she tries not to feed him on demand, but um, she wants, especially if she wants to go back to sleep, because it tends to be during the middle yes. of the night. Oh um, God! What, what can you advise, be... really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why do they wake up at four thirty? Four thirty. Yep. That's a common kitty time. Okay, if Boris is thin, which I'm kind of guessing is an 18-year-old hyperthyroid, he's not fat. I would get him an automatic feeder and set it to go off at 415. That's a very good plan. <laughs> I like that plan. <laughs> Although that's, that, would... that will only work with the dry food. So you're going to have to find a dry food that he, that he will eat um, without the gravy on it. But if you'll eat a dry food, and some of the senior diets that are higher in calories are, are at least for my fussy old cat, seem to be pretty palatable. So kind of look into that and yeah, because otherwise, and he's going to, oh, God, they're so good at training us. He's going to train you to get up at 4.30 and feed him, or he already has. Um, and I I haven't been trained to feed, but I have been trained to wake up in the middle of the night and pet because of inadvertent reinforcement. Um, there's no way you're going to keep him, because you're going to have to get up and feed him in order to go back to sleep. So um, see if he'll eat dry food on a feeder and if he will just if that'll he might go down and bother the feeder instead of you <laughs> fingers crossed well they've had lots of comments coming through saying that was very interesting and amusing talk Great. so that they found it really really interesting uh, so yes i would like to thank you marge for a really really interesting talk i found it absolutely fascinating for my, myself Great. as well it's been a pleasure. Uh, so i thank you to everyone who's listened this evening um, I'd like to thank Luke, who's working on the technical side for the webinar vet as well this evening. 
And again, thank you to Feline Friends for making this wonderful series possible. And I hope everyone has really, really enjoyed it because I absolutely did, Marge. Great. Um, so Thanks, thank you and good night. <coughs> good night. Okay.